little background on what this work is about. Um, my book from 2006 was called Underwriting, and it was actually conceived while I was still in grad school. Uh, while I was finishing my, my um, dissertation, I was uh, a temp at Cigna Corporation, Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of resourceful, intellectually resourceful, so I, it's, it, not to brag, but it's one of those things I, I do. And um, so I was working at uh, Cigna as a temp because I had had my first child and I was desperate for money. And I would take my lunches in their incredible archives. They have this incredible uh, museum. Uh, it was originally located in the, in the first floor of this massive 50 plus foot uh, story tower in Philadelphia. I think they had moved it since. But they had some really cool artifacts that were related mostly to fire, fire stuff. Um, and my favorite and most um, arresting one was of Benjamin Franklin. It's a portrait painted of him in the 19th century wearing a fireman's hat. Uh, so it was anachronistic, it was weird, and I thought to myself, yeah, there's this incredible early American thing going on here, what's it all about? And I remember actually, George Justice and I were friends in, in grad school, and I remember asking him, I said to him, you know, what do you think about this as an idea for a follow-up book? What, what do you think about the idea that, that insurance is a sort of textual um, process that um, we have devised culturally um, to to marry or to connect written ideas, notions of property, things like that, to material things. That is the way capitalism is, de is designed to, to control these things. Um, and so in making that connection, George said, yeah, that's a really great idea. So, I, so since then, I've always sort of trusted George on, on evaluating my ideas. Um, so, it, it carried with it a lot of resonance. Um, it sort of sat with me for a long time. Um, so I wrote this book about insurance and I, I, it, in many ways it was a very traditional book. It was five chapters, <laughs> dealt with some famous canonical authors. Uh, it, it sort of twirled around the concept of insurance as a, as a sort of guardrail against loss, against material loss. And how do writers from Phyllis Wheatley to Noah Webster to Emerson, how are they dealing with this, you know, both in, in their own personal lives and, and in, their, in their fictions or their poetry or their dictionaries? Um, so I wrote this book, and it was not a particularly archivally-based book. Um, there were moments where I sort of went as far down into the archives as I wouldn't need to be, but I didn't base the research for the book on archival research. So flash forward now to the last three or four years, and I've gotten interested and immersed in the digital humanities and what that means for us as humanities scholars. And for my money, um, most of the work that I've been interested in to date um, has the most applicability of the work that I've done to date has um, that has that the most applicability from from my work to digital humanities resides in that past work, the past work on the insurance um, underwriters, broadly understood. So, um, so as I've been partnering with people, namely a guy named Mark Thibault over in uh, history, who also wrote about um, fire and insurance in St. Louis for his first book, it's a brilliant book from Hopkins. Um, we partnered on, on a project to start rethinking insurance archives as, a, as digital artifacts, what that would mean. We actually are thinking in very sort of um, mercenary ways too about this relocation of State Farm <laughs> just north of our campus. So what what possibilities that might hold as well. The insurance industry as archivists are incredible archivists. They love to talk about their historical past. Um, and so part of that, that's a great gift, and it's also been a very interesting um, obstacle in many ways. I actually wrote a, 
a, a piece, and I actually have a book concept in the works about how corporate entities have stood in the way of different kinds of um, historical data related to insurance, namely uh, slave registries um, from from ships. Uh, so so we've had this project going, and and I kind of cobbled together this presentation in 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 relation to the work Mark and I have been doing. So we gave we actually gave a joint plenary last last. Uh, spring at North Texas University, and so that's what I'm going to try to take you guys through. Um, and and it's more exhortatory. It's really not. It's kind of like Keith's. It's more of an overview. It's not. It's kind of making connections and running away. So forgive me if if you wanted something more uh, close. Um, so to begin to think about uh, insurance and, and the digital, I decided to start with the idea of vanishing points, right? Um, so I'm interested in, the, if you can't read it, I'll just read out it. I'm interested in the materials of risk as they're expressed in frequency. These are very simply the materials that make possible the, the practices of repeatedly counting up from zero over a course of time. To count is to add an identical unit, sufficiently discrete, and yet nonetheless identical to its predecessor, to a tally. In the process of counting down to zero, subtracting sufficiently identical units records a progression towards absence. I hasten to add that counting down is where my particular fascination is charged interpretively. That is, accounting for what's lost in the passage of time or an interval towards a vanishing point or zero. This, this trajectory is functionally what is called a loss. Fortunately, down counting is a phenomenon that has many implications within the humanities and beyond. The computational effects of interpretation, of filling our worlds and even emptying them are the stuff of major grants and big data. They are the means by which we assemble curricula, believe it or not, and denote historical change. And maybe more, more importantly, they are the stuff of major commercial enterprises. They are also a way to think about how archival data can retrieve lost human lives, as problematic as that might sound. They are also a way to think about the aesthetics of archival material and what those aesthetics say to us who might be enthralled by data's useful austerity. Um, I have to say, I have to admit that, and, and I will gladly you know, cop to this, insurance as a topic is dreadfully boring. It's the most boring thing you could imagine wanting to write about. So the trick and the challenge for me is how to make it less boring. Um, so I, so aesthetics is part of that. Um, but also thinking about lost human lives, I think is important. Um, live data, archives of lives. I kind of borrowed this live data notion from Jackie Vernamont, our new um, Renaissance scholar here. I found that questions having to do with counting and accounting have answers that are deeply humanistic that what we think of as exclusively related to business or the digital or computational or even the, to the forensic are part of categories of interpretation that are lively, not to say even alive. And when we ask questions that broach life, we find ourselves at least partially on the somatic grounds of the human. So for instance, we ask to ask the question of longevity of assets, which is a common term in insurance documents, indeed their aliveness, is only to make the situation more complex. So the lives of assets, what counts as an asset or a life? Do contracts have lives? It's an important legal question that occupies massive reams of state law, and insurance is pretty much argued out state by state. Um, it, is, it is incredible how much um, ink has been spilled on this question. The answer is yes, legally speaking, but it also depends on the kind of property the contract names. If that property is human, as in the biological term designated in life insurance, or the ongoing ambiguity of the term life of the contract, or when marine insurance um, named slaves, enslaved peoples in the terms, as it often did, it signals a responsibility that cuts both ways, asking us only whose interest motivates the investment. The interests of a party involve inherently narrative-driven historical questions. Determining the nature of responsibility for the insured becomes a matter of locating the origins of the identified 
parties. So I have an example of that. Um, they, basically, insurance data actually is a really good way to encode narrative-driven historical questions. Um, and I call this, in a sort of wink to digital humanities, the prehistory of data mining. And I give this example. Um, does anyone know what that is? Kind of a blurry, digitized photo. You know, it's the reconstruction of uh, James Madison's estate called Montpelier. Um, and I titled this, uh, Barring the Deridian Ontologies, Ontologies of Bureaucracy. So it is insurance policies that are often the most reliable documents when reconstructing the facts of slavery that have been either lost or deliberately erased. Um, because if you go to a lot of plantations and ask to see the slave quarters or whatever, um, they've kind of disappeared, right? Um, but insurance contracts are the one place where the property owners were very vigilant about recording those things, among other places, but that's a really good place to look if you're looking for buried past. Um, so there's James Madison's plantation in Montpelier. Historians used a surviving fire insurance policy in order to reconstruct the enslaved people's quarters that had been disappeared from Montpelier's grounds, and that's what you're looking at here. They're called actually ghost structures. Um, yeah, they're the ghosting structures in Madison's south yard. Um, and in fact, they, they've, those documents have enabled uh, archaeologists and historians to recover quite a bit of stuff and then convert it into digital objects. So you can see, for instance, this is a sculpture that they picked up and they actually managed to make it into a cool 3D thing um, that's buried uh, amongst um, the sleeve property. And so it's a, the archival policy becomes central to the obligations of identity here and the fluctuations of meaning that property imparts to objects and people. Data's presence invo invokes an austerity that derives from self-evidence of itself of referenti referentiality. It asks only to believe to be believed. So what I mean by that is that when we look into the archives and we find data, we find blueprints or names and numbers, um, it can be blindingly boring and, and mundane, or it can actually be the secret to its own boringness, if you know what I mean. Um, so it's abundantly clear to me that the life of data from its earliest incarnation is double entry loss bookkeeping has a material presence. And if you start to think about that each number or each name or each column, columnization of lives or objects has a material past, it, it brings it back to life to a certain extent. And it even has an aesthetic modality that seems to belie its own self-evident austerity. So I would ask to consider the corporate minutes and lost books of Lloyd's of London from the 1790s and late 1830s. So, as a result of my collaborating with Mark Thibault, um, I went back to London. I decided um, if I really wanted to understand the materiality, the archival thinginess of insurance, I would go back to at least its, ang its earliest Anglo um, incarnations uh, as part of the earliest moments of Anglo capitalism. And uh, so I went to London and started looking originally at the, in the in Guild Hall, which is part of old, you know, the old London archives. And the, they sent me to the London Metropolitan Archives because everything's been sort of moved around. And then I eventually ended up at a place called the Chartered Insurance Institute, which is a fascinating archive. One of the coolest places I've ever been. It's in this old sort of um, uh, Gothic building in the middle of the financial district uh, in old London, uh, the city of London, and uh, it's filled, literally just filled with the artifacts of, of old um, insurance um, from the street signs and building markers that were used uh, as part of its sort of adjunct fire keeping or fire prevention uh, role to masses of old policies 
and agent books, um, broker books, all sorts of stuff. And I, like I said, the insurance world loves to hold on to this stuff. And I think it makes sense in a way if you think about it, because insurance is all about preservation, right? At some level, they're all about recovering stuff or making sure stuff doesn't get lost and accounting for stuff. So it's this kind of neat um, cultural site. So I ended up there, and this is where I found a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you now and make um, maybe lame arguments for its aesthetic qualities. So you can see some of these. These are lost books from Lloyd's. Um, and Lloyd's, of course, is the... It's not an insurance company, really. It's, it's a brokerage. It, it, it takes underwriters and, and brings them together with people who need underwriting. Uh, and it became very successful at it, and of course became, in some sense, this sort of umbrella exchange for the massive undertaking of insuring the capitalist world um, from London. So part of the story of our social and cultural financialization is how we make our minutes, itself a literal metaphorizing of the textualizing of frequency. When you talk about the minutes of a meeting, or it arises in corporate settings. Um, who's taking the minutes, right? Um, so it's, it's a way of counting. And, pres and presence at executive collaboration, collaborations, otherwise known as meetings, both visible and legible. But it's also how we at the same time, beneath the boring cumulative, cumulativeness of counting and archiving, disappear them in the forgettable and losable materiality of an archive. So we take minutes and then we just get rid of it as quickly as we can. We vote on it, we're done with it. We don't have to look at it anymore. But it's archived somewhere, it goes somewhere. Such documents deform the naturalness of the denotative narratological page. That's my argument. Here is the prototype of modernist poetics. This is a little more extreme. It's experimental line breaks. It's listing of personages as actual, as actual realignments. It's a apostrophic, a apostrophic address to corporate fictions, which if you read corporate minutes, that's their, their apostrophes to, to, to the corporation, which is itself a fiction. They are, the, they are the artifactual singularities of the age of mechanical reproduction and its regime of units. And if you're familiar with Walter Benjamin, you could hear what I'm trying to do there. So the documents are lo uh, of loss are full of things, is basically my argument. And those things have a both formal property and, and, and a sort of more um, flowing data property, accountable property. So here's an example from Monday, 2nd of January, 1837. Uh, hard to read, I know, but sort of get it, get, you can get the feel of it. It names lost ships, cargoes, destinations, events, names of captains. Um, it's all salvaged in the record. The loss requires the conceptual regulation that is captured in the layout generates a set of correspondences that are divided and referenced in a kind of what I'm calling in, intimate containment there. Again, think about modernist poetics if you dare. Um, it's also following the money from agent to fire to book. And here is a, uh, the managers of the Sun Fire Office report to the directors of the Phoenix Fire Office. I didn't choose it just because it's from Phoenix, uh, from 1803. Uh, and here, you, if you dig a little deeper, you, can, you can't see it really in this photo, but if you were to get a little closer, you could see that uh, in January, October 1795, there is um, there's this kind of, to me, deeply poetic and suggestive term in closing the ruins. And it seems to suggest to, um, well, I mean, one of the things that, uh, that, was a, that was a cost for an insurance uh, agent was if a fire had burned something down, you had to safely enclose the ruins uh, so that people didn't hurt themselves or they didn't, it didn't spread the fire. It was an actual term of art for an activity. Um, but in some sense, that's what kind of archives, went, especially when, it, when you're dealing with ruins, I mean, with insurance, but archives in general are enclosing the ruins. And again, there is that kind of Walter Benjamin-like um, resonance to that term. There's also fascinating symbologies that circulate through a lot of these documents. Um, each insurance um, firm had its own elaborate um, uh, imprint on their policies. So you would 
you know, if you were working with uh, Phoenix or uh, the Sunfire office or whatever it might be, they had their own set of symbols that they were invested in and were really, you know, talk about um, logoed identity. They were, they, they spread like, they spread them everywhere uh, they could. They would put them on their clothes. If you can see, yeah, you can't, you can't really see it. Self-referencing self -referen self imagery designed to ensure the values after loss. So it's very recursive. So you can't really see it. There's a green arrow pointing to the shoulder of one of the guys in this image. And he's actually wearing, um, he's wearing this. So there's this kind of like um, doubling up of, um, of the imagery. And I kind of read that as, as again, a, a bulwark against loss. It's, you know, it's making things replete with things. Um, and it's kind of very urgent in a lot of the symbols of, of, um, of insurance documents. Here's something called uh, blind embossing. Uh, so you look, you start looking through uh, old insurance policies, you will quickly become uh, familiar with, with what this is. Uh, where uh, you take a piece of paper and you kind of layer it over the top and then you burn it into the paper beneath it. Um, and it and it carries with it the imprint of, of the sort of burned or the sort of um, uh, smushing together of the two texts. Um, and I, I wanted to start thinking about that as a kind of hierarchical data, which is uh, a term that's got some relevance in, in thinking about digital humanities. Uh, and the way we encounter texts, for instance, uh, in Scalar, uh, or a lot of, of up-to-date websites where things are layered mm -hmm. and you can move through the, da the data in hierarchical ways. Um, and it's sort of related, I see it also as related to a kind of um, a, a, a mass, an amassing of authenticity. You know, how do you, how do you, what are these things for? Why are they trying to uh, press home the sense of, of weightiness and, and three-dimensionality? Um, and it has to do, again, with that, that needfulness for um, material presence. And authenticity um, and, and the personal signatures that, that are represented by those. Here you can see an even better, more up close version, the sideways from the Royal Exchange uh, of, an, of, a, of an embossed indicia. Here are some other examples of the, of the different uh, iconographies, <coughs> symbologies, and iconographies of, of the insurance policies. And again, this is a kind of layered materiality. You can see um, this is not a text, it's a, it's a badge that was worn um, by a, an exchange a fireman of the Royal Exchange. Um, the building depicted in this artifact, so this is the reason why I'm using this, uh, burned in its, itself, it burned in 1837. It was built in 1669, and it was actually the home to Lloyd's insurance market. So it had this massive kind of deep uh, uh, historical resonance uh, as it was recycled into the insurance industry uh, that, that did everything it could to keep other things from burning. Uh, it's kind of ironic. Um, the buildings of that textual presence are layered, much as we layer data today in the hierarchy hierarchies of data. And so I actually reference in this piece here, um, a piece by David Berry in Boundary 2 from last year about um, the flat theory of, of, um, of iPhone designs uh, and how um, the late, the, uh, it was the latest iOS at the time, but how the iOS had switched from a, a depth icon to a flat icon and what that meant. Um, so I, it's an interesting um, kind of play that, that corporate entities play, you know, work with and have worked with for a long time. Um, so this, this, it, this thing goes from uh, the, the human arm you know, as part of the badging to the contract and to the buildings themselves. There's also a really fascinating um, architecture at work within the Royal Exchange that I, that I noticed in going through the archives. And it kind of has to do, if, you, if you're familiar with Emmanuel Wallerstein's um, uh, world systems theory, uh, it's kind of all here. Uh, 
And this is an image from uh, Lloyd's Dictionary of Trade and Commerce from 1758. I have an image of the, of the uh, frontispiece uh, later on. So it's part of the rage to arrange the commercial world as a smooth hierarchy. The map of the Royal Exchange itself microcosmically set out the national and ethnic contours of the globe within its contours. Can't really see it that well here. At the center was a grounding concern that what could be lost at the widening peripheries of the, of the colonies. It is important to understand this is an information circuit in its design, but also more prosaically as a place to execute personal signatures. So what, what basically would happen is if you go into the exchange, you um, can con contract with underwriters from um, who had cargoes destined for different parts of the world. Um, and, and so for instance, you, you can't quite see it that well, but here's Portugal, France, Italy, Dutch, uh, Turkey, um, Barbados, Jamaica, Virginia, India, Norway, East Country, Irish. You know, it's, it, there is a kind of attempt to regularize, um, if not sort of centralize and, and peripherize the, the various nationalities, but to place people into orders through which um, the underwriters would, would, would circuit. Here's a painting, actually, of that exchange. Uh, and you can see the sort of personal work going on within this ar architecture of exchanging signatures, exchanging information, etc. cetera. Uh, it's a painting. Um, it's Lloyd's subscription room. Um, and I, one, of the, one of the interesting parts of that dictionary of trade has this definition of what a signature means. Um, and signatures are one of those great things that we look for, I think, in archives. Um, they sort of jump out uh, on the page of, of a sort of otherwise um, print text. Uh, and so I wanted to think about what signatures meant as a kind of, uh, as a kind of symbol uh, more than who they were. Um, and they're legally constructed actually as promises, and they were actually specifically talked about that way in the 18th century. So each one becomes an envoy, an envoy to the future, a set of interpretive possibilities that are contingent upon events to come. The events and their material signifies are thus always connected through the signature. So you can see here um, in the English language, it says subscription in the English language is used for um, any, any interest which any particular person takes in a public stock or trading company by writing their names and the shares they require in the books, um, blah, 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 blah. In the commerce of books, subscription signifies an engagement to take a certain number of copies of a book going to be printed. Um, so basically, it, it's, it's sort of bearing out this idea that um, it, it is it is a promise. It is a promise to the future. Uh, so in conclusion, I just wanted to sort of exhort us to think about um, these insurance materials as fertile grids, right? So grid being something we don't think of as necessarily fertile, but, um, but imaginatively and historically they are. Uh, so what if we reverse engineered the archive, understand the present interface with data is coextensive with a set of pasts that is alive. The historical archive becomes an enlightened, an enlivened and aestheticized database that shares some present design imperatives. We should be careful to remember that this relationship between present and past is, is ideologically organized. So it's not just an aesthetic thing that you can play with, and it's not sort of free-floating theory. It actually has political uh, structuring uh, capacities that were very real and take us in very real ways to the ideologies of the present. One temptation of countdown is a lulling, uh, sort of sameness, again and again, sort of frequency as boring. Um, but my urging here is to, to think of it as a, as a countdown to the waking. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll try to open it up to any discussion.